Hello class and welcome to today's lecture in social psychology. My name is Dr. Neil Sogi. Uh, today we're diving into a fascinating topic that plays a role in nearly every aspect of our lives. Persuasion and social influence. And this subject isn't just a key area in social psychology, it's also a, a daily reality we all experience in various ways, whether it's making a decision based on someone else's advice, or being convinced by compelling advertisement, or finding ourselves mirroring a group's behavior. So to get started, I'd like you to think of a time when you felt influenced or persuaded by someone or something in, in a way that uh, surprised you. Maybe it was a friend convincing you to try something new, or a salesperson convincing you to buy something that you didn't plan on buying, or even a group situation when you changed your opinion just to match others. What was that experience like? How did you feel about that experience? Were you happy with that choice? I want you to just take a moment and think about that to get us warmed up for today's lecture. Now, now that we've uh, begun thinking a little bit about our, our own experiences with persuasion and influence, let's take a look at what we're going to be covering today. As always, I want to start with a little story about an important someone in social psychology, and then we'll move on to the mechanisms in, of persuasion and influence. We'll basically look at how are you persuaded? And how does persuasion work? What are the tactics? What are the strategies that commonly used to influence people? We'll uh, look at people like Robert uh, Cialdini's uh, principle of persuasion, such as reciprocity and scarcity. We'll, and we'll dive into uh, just a reminder of what we did last week with the elaboration likelihood model. And as that really does a good job in helping us explain the difference between central and peripheral roots of persuasion, as you hopefully remember. We'll then dive into some individual and situational factors in persuasion, things like personality and self-esteem and your mood and the group dynamics and how all of that plays out. And we'll look at some famous studies on that. And then we'll look at long-term effects of social influence um, and consider kind of the broader implications of uh, persuasion and social influence on behavior and attitudes and just in society as a whole. Um, now, while some influence is temporary, other forms create very lasting changes in attitudes and actions. And we'll discuss concepts like groupthink and cognitive dissonance and social impact theory, which help explain why and how influence can lead to profound and enduring change sometimes for better, and sometimes, uh, as history has shown, for worse. But uh, I want to kind of start off today by uh, acknowledging a pioneer in the field of persuasion and social influence, a fellow by the name of Carl Hovland. He was born in 1912 in Chicago, and Hovland was and was a someone that's often credited as one of the founders of research on persuasion and attitude change. He really did lay the groundwork for understanding the psychological mechanisms behind why we're influenced by others. And Hovland's career is actually quite interesting. Um, he began when he joined the U.S. Army during World War II, uh, where he led what was called the Why We Fight research program. And he was really aimed at using film to influence soldiers' morale and attitudes. And his studies revealed that not all persuasive messages are equally effective. There is the source of the message, the structure, and the emotional tone 
all played crucial roles in how well soldiers retained information and adjusted their beliefs. And this early work informed his famous Yale attitude change approach that was developed in collaboration with some Yale University colleagues. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about his uh, Yale University, sorry, Yale attitude change approach. Um, because if we break it down, there are some key components to it. First off, we need to consider who is giving the message. Well, do they have credibility? And then, are they attractive? Do they have expertise in delivering the message? Then, what's the content of the message? That's the message part. And is it emotional, logical, or a combination of both? And then finally, who is the audience? Because the characteristics of those messages that are received um, factor into things like the audience's self-esteem, their prior beliefs, and their need for ideas and cognition. So, a little bit of background on Hovland and his work and, and his legacy. Um, Hovland's work at Yale uh, not only advanced psychological theories, but also laid the groundwork for modern-day advertising and propaganda analysis and even educational design. His, his studies highlighted the complexity of persuasion, showing that it's not just about what's said, but who says it and to whom and in what context. And this nuanced understanding has, was really kind of revolutionary at the time and remains foundational in social psychology. His concepts are integral to various fields today where understanding audience characteristics and adjusting message strategies are key to effective influence. Now, Hovland passed away maturely, uh, in, uh, prematurely in 1961, but his legacy still endures. And he has gone on to inspire countless psychologists and uh, people like uh, Robert Kialdal Kialdini, um, who have expanded on uh, Hovland's work and have... Uh, use those principles of persuasion. And the whole idea here is that when you are using communication, persuasion is the key. And you need to be mindful of who the communicator is, what type of message is being given, and what are the factors of the audience so that you can persuade the person effectively. Now, let's dive into the mechanics of persuasion by looking at some of the most researched and widely used uh, tactics. And here is where we get into Robert Cialdini's um, work as one of the leading psychologists in the study of influence. Um, now, he's identified six core principles of persuasion that help explain why people are swayed to certain messages. And these principles are reciprocity, commitment, social proof, authority, liking, and scarcity. So let's dive into each one of these. Uh, starting off with reciprocity. Now, the principle of reciprocity really operates on the idea that people feel an obligation to return the favor. When someone does something kind or helpful for us, we often feel compelled to give something in return. And a classic study by Regan in 1971 tested this by giving some participants a small gift, a soda, before asking them to buy raffle tickets. And those who received the gift were more likely to purchase tickets than those who didn't, demonstrating that even small acts of kindness can increase compliance. Then there is commitment and consistency. And this principle relies on our desire to act in ways that are consistent with our 
previous commitments or beliefs. Uh, once we've committed to something, we are more likely to follow through to stay consistent with our self-image. The foot in the door technique is a well-known example of this principle where people are first asked to agree to a small request, making them more likely to agree to a larger request later on. And so back in the 1960s, Friedman and, and Fraser found that people who were more willing to display a large yard sign for a cause if they were previously had agreed to a smaller request related to the same cause. Then there is the whole idea of social proof. And this is the idea that Uh, really kind of refers to the tendency to look to others when determining how to behave, especially in unfamiliar situations. If everyone around us is doing something, we're often assumed that that's the correct thing to do. And so there's been lots of studies that have shown that people are more likely to engage in a behavior if they believe others are doing it too. Such as, you know, we could say, uh, reusing hotel towels or donating to a charity. And so social proof can be a very powerful situation, powerful um, tool within a situation where group norms are ambiguous or unclear. And as long as you provide some social proof, it tends to change people's behavior. Then there is authority. And people are more likely to comply with requests or follow guidance from figures they perceive as authority figures. And Stanley Milgram's obedience experiment is the famous standard here, where um, uh, someone who was dressed up as a doctor or a scientist told people to do things that they wouldn't normally do, and they did them. And then the idea of liking. And the liking principle is based on that simple idea that we're more likely to be influenced by people we like. Uh, different researchers have found that factors like being similar to the other person or receiving compliments from the other person or the physical attractiveness of the other person all increase our tendency to be persuaded by someone. And then finally, scarcity. And scarcity operates on the idea that people place a higher value on things that are less available. When we believe something is in short supply, we feel a greater urgency to act before it's too late. And studies show that people's preferences shift when they're told an item or opportunity is limited. For instance, um, there's some studies in, in the 1970s that found that cookies were rated as more desir desirable when they were in limited supply. It's the whole idea of the limited time offer. That's where you kind of get that in marketing or the exclusive deals. These kind of create a sense of, of uh, urgency within a person's mind and get them thinking in those terms. Now, I want to kind of revisit the elaboration likelihood model. Now we've we've touched on this before, but I want to kind of go through and explore a little bit more about it. <clears throat> um, there is two routes to persuasion. There's the central route to persuasion, uh, which involves the thoughtful consideration of the arguments and information presented in the message. And when people are motivated and able to process information carefully, they tend to evaluate the quality and relevance of the arguments. If the arguments are compelling and logical, people are more likely to change their attitudes in a way that is enduring and resistant to counter persuasion. So for example, if someone is interested in purchasing a new computer, they may carefully research and evaluate different brands based upon technical specs and price and reviews. And if the message is relevant and the argument strong, the persuasion achieved through this route tends to be lasting. It's like 
everybody should buy a Lexus or a Toyota. Not everybody does because there's another route and that route is the persuasion route. Uh, and the, uh, sorry, the peripheral route. And the peripheral route, on the other hand, occurs when individuals are either not made it motivated or not able to engage in deep processing of the message. Instead, the focusing on, uh, instead of focusing on the quality of the arguments, they rely on peripheral cues such as attractiveness or credibility of the speaker or the, the popularity of the speaker and the number of the arguments presented or the emotional appeal of the message. Persuasion achieved through peripheral route tends to be more temporary and more susceptible to change. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. There are a lot of different factors that play into the elaborate uh, into persuasion and the elaboration likelihood model just does a really good job of uh, helping us to understand that in different ways. Now I want to kind of touch on a little bit about the role of social norms in influence because in addition to specific tactics and processing routes social norms play a very significant role in guiding our behavior and shaping our attitudes. And social norms are these unwritten rules about acceptable behavior within a group or society. They influence everything from the way we dress to how we behave in public. And understanding these norms is essential for grasping how social influence operates. And there's different types of social norms. There's descriptive norms that are our perception of what others are doing in a particular situation and basically they tell us what is common behavior then there's injunctive norms and injunctive norms are about what we believe others think we should do and these norms are often associated with moral approval or disapproval so for instance even if littering is common in a particular area which would be a descriptive norm, most people still recognize that littering is generally frowned upon, which is an injunctive norm. And there is some well-known studies on social norms and things like energy conservation. Um, one of those was from Nolan in 2008 that demonstrated how powerful descriptive norms can be in changing a person's behavior. And in this study, homeowners were informed about their neighbor's energy usage and how that reduced their own energy consumption more than those who received only general tips on saving energy. And this shows that when people perceive a behavior as the norm among their peers, they are more likely to adopt it themselves. And this, of course, has some significant um, meanings when you're looking at persuading people in marketing or in public campaigns or in political or environmental um, campaigns. Then there's the whole idea of conformity. Conformity is... Uh, something that really kind of builds on the whole idea of social norms, but conformity really refers to the tendency of individuals to align their behaviors and beliefs and behaviors with those of a particular group. And conformity helps maintain social harmony and can be beneficial in creating a sense of cohesion, but it can also lead to pressure that overrides personal judgments and uh, beliefs. And the psychologist Solomon Ash conducted uh, some foundational research in the 1950s about that, that we've already talked about, but we'll uh, continue to talk about them again. Now, the whole idea behind this is that if you believe 
that everybody else is making a certain decision and they're part of your group, you will have a tendency to make that same decision as well. In fact, about, even though you might know it's wrong, about 75% of the time you would rather conform to what the group says than rather uh, than, than pick the what you know is correct. So that just goes to show how powerful group, conform, group conformity is. And there's a lot that goes into the idea of conformity. There's the issue of group size. Uh, conformity tends to increase with the group size, but only up to a point. So um, once there's about five members, you don't really need any more to improve group conformity. There's also unanimity. Um, when the group is unanimous on an opinion, conformity rates are higher. There's also culture. Um, different cultures have um, a little bit of a different view on conformity. Collectivist cultures will tend to prioritize group harmony and cohesion. And so they often exhibit higher rates of conformity than do individualistic cultures. So there is a little bit of variability in conformity, but the idea is that if you want to influence someone with conformity, you show that this is a popular choice and that people are liking it and they're sharing it. That's part of the reason why um, social media often amplifies conformity by showcasing the liked or shared content created. And this creates the perception of a widespread approval of that topic. And then, of course, we come to Solomon Ashes' study on, or sorry, the, the Milgram, Stanley Milgram's uh, study on uh, obedience to authority. Because um, conformity explains how social pressure can influence our behavior, but obedience to authority explores how we respond when instructions come from a recognized authority figure. And this type of influence can be very, very powerful, sometimes leading individuals to act against their own moral judgments. And Stanley Milgram's obedience experiment in the 1960s provided a foundational understanding of how authority figures can drive people to take actions they might otherwise avoid. And the whole idea between Milgram's experiment was he wanted to see how far people would go in obeying an authority figure, even if it involved inflicting harm on other people. And so participants were told that they were part of a study on learning, where they were instructed by an authority figure, the experimenter, who was dressed in the lab coat, to look authoritative, to administer increasingly severe electric shocks on the learner, who was actually a confederate of the experimenter, whenever the learner uh, answered a qu question incorrectly. Now, although no real shocks were delivered, participants believed they were real and that the learner was in genuine pain. And shockingly, 65% of participants continued to administer shocks up to the maximum voltage, despite the learners, although staged, pleas for mercy. And many participants, while they expressed discomfort and hesitated, they ultimately followed the experimenter's instructions. And so this shows, through Milgram's experiment, a lot of interesting things. First off, it shows that people are more likely to obey, obey instructions from an authority figure they believe and perceive to be as legitimate. That's part of the reason why in the military you have a commander close by. So like, for example, a tank commander. The tank commander doesn't do the shooting, doesn't do the driving, but he's part of the team to tell the others what to do. There's also the idea of proximity of the authority figure. The physical closeness of the authority figure also has an impact on obedience. When the experimenter was in the same room as the participant, obedience rates go way up. 
And finally, when you depersonalize the victim, when you just call the person a learner and they're in a separate room and you can't see them and they are not physically close, then you have a increase in obedience. It's only when they're in the same room with you that the obedience drops. And so it's interesting how these little things can go a long ways to um, push someone to do things that they wouldn't normally do. And we see this in the real world all the time. We see this in military actions. We see this in, in, uh, uh, in many, many ways. And it can be something that we should always be mindful of. And then finally, we come to some compliance techniques. And these compliance techniques are, um, you know, while obedience goes a long ways, we can't always just have an authority figure telling us what to do. Compliance techniques are more like sales. Um, and they're very extensively used in sales and marketing and social interaction. And what they do is they encourage people to say yes to certain requests. And here we'll look at some well-known compliance strategies and the research that supports their effectiveness. Um, there's first off the foot in the door technique. And this technique involves getting someone to agree to a small request first, um, which increases the likelihood that they'll agree to a larger related request later on. If you recall, I, I mentioned uh, some studies in the 1960s by Friedman and Fraser that demonstrated this technique by asking homeowners to put a small sign in their window in support of safe driving. And later, they, those who had agreed to the small request were more likely to agree to display a much larger sign on their lawn. And the theory is that by agreeing to the first request, individuals see themselves as helpful or committed to the cause, which makes it easier to comply to the second, more large request. Then there's the door in the face technique. And this technique works by making an unreasonably large request that is likely to be refused and then you follow that by a smaller request and the contrast makes the second request seem more reasonable and um, increases the chance for compliance so that becomes a, 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 a good technique then there's the low ball technique and the low ball technique involves initially offering an attractive deal to get someone to commit, then revealing some hidden costs or changing the terms. And once someone has agreed, they're more likely to stick with the deal, even if it's no longer as favorable. So like this, for example, would be, you know, um, someone offers you to sell you a brand new car for $19,000. And then you find out that on top of that $19,000 purchase price is a destination fee of $2,000 and uh, a warranty fee and a setup fee. And so it ends up being $25,000, but you've already committed to the 19. So another six, well, okay, fine. I'll, I'll buy into that. That's the idea behind that. And then there's the, that's not all technique. And this technique involves presenting an initial offer, then enhancing that offer by adding something extra before the person makes a decision. And the additional bonus makes the deal appear more valuable and attractive. And any time that you have, um, you know, a, a buy one, get a second pair free or um, or you ever watch those TV commercials or YouTube commercials, they're always like, oh, that's not all, there's something more. That's part of what this technique is all about. It's about getting people to buy in. So there's lots of different strategies for compliance techniques. 
And basically, compliance techniques are effective because they tap into basic psychological principles such as consistency and reciprocity and our desire to make choices that feel reasonable and beneficial. And so by understanding the, these techniques, we can be more aware of when they're used and when they're being used on us so we can uh, make better, more conscious decision-making choices in our lives and we don't get sucked into paying an extra $6,000 for a vehicle that we didn't really want to start with. Then there's the idea of groupthink. And while compliance techniques show how individuals can be influenced by others in one-on-one -on -one situations, groupthink is a phenomenon that occurs within group dynamics. And groupthink really describes a situation where the desire for harmony and conformity is in a group leads to poor decision making as members suppress dissenting opinions and fail to critically analyze alternatives. And Irving Janus coined this term back in 1972 and identified some characteristics that I think are important and that make conditions um, where groups become susceptible to groupthink because groupthink is not something desirable in any way, shape, or form. So there's first off the illusion of invulnerability that group members may develop an excessive optimism, believing that the group's decisions are infallible and immune to failure. And this could be a risky decision as members ignore potential pitfalls. And then there's the collective rationalization where groups often dismiss warning signs and negative feedback by rationalizing decisions collectively. And group members may convince themselves that any concerns are unfounded, which discourages individuals from voicing doubts. And then there's the belief in the group's moral superiority, where the group members may believe strongly in the inherent morality of their group's purpose or actions, which can justify some unethical behavior and discourage any questioning of the group pattern. Uh, this pressure on dissenters, and this is when individuals that do raise objections may experience some social pressure to conform, um, which discourages dis, um, some any real honest feedback. And this pressure often creates a, an environment where dissent is discouraged, leading to a very narrow-minded approach. Um, of course, there's self-censure in this because individuals in the group may withhold their doubts and keep silent, assuming that if others are in agreement, their concerns must not be valid. And this self-censorship creates an illusion of unanimous support. There's the illusion of unanimity uh, because dissenting voices are suppressed or self-censored, groupthink creates an illusion of unanimous agreement, reinforcing the idea that the group is fully aligned. And then finally, there's mind guards, because there are some group members that take it upon themselves to protect the group from adverse information or dissenting uh, viewpoints. And they basically act as mind guards who shield the group from ideas that might disrupt consensus. And what ends up happening is that there are certain social conditions that contribute to groupthink, like high group cohesiveness. If everyone's the same or feel that they're part of the same group, then they tend to value that more than rational decision. Also, if you isolate yourself from outside opinions, that can go a long ways to groupthink. If there's a directive from the leader and this pressure from leadership, that can lead to groupthink as well, as well as stressful situations. So high stake situations or a crisis can create pressure for a quick decision. And that oftentimes that leads to a rush to judgment and less critical analysis, all of which can cause some very deep problems. Now, there are important ways of managing groupthink. One, of course, is just simply having open dialogue with people from other groups. Um, 
So if a leader encourages group members to voice their opinions, even if they challenge the group's views, fostering this can minimize groupthink. You can also do what is simply appointing a devil's advocate, this, where somebody helps to and, and works to ensure that alternative perspectives are considered and that group members feel safe, questioning dominant ideas. There is seeking external feedback, um, using consultants, using groups from outside of the group to get a broader perspective and alternative views. Very important. And finally, using structured decision-making processes. When you implement systematic processes like listing the pros and the cons or using anonymous feedback, that helps to create a balanced view and that too reduces groupthink because group pressure is extremely powerful. Then there is uh, social impact theory. Um, this was uh, something developed by the psychologist Bib Latane in the uh, 1980s and provides a framework for understanding how people are influenced by others based on the number and strength and immediacy of the people around them. And so this theory really helps to explain why some social settings or groups can have a powerful impact on our behaviors and attitudes while others may have little or no influence upon us. So it really kind of boils down to the strength of the the influence that these people have. So things like power and status and expertise and relevance is going to play a, a big role in this. The idea of immediacy uh, refers to the closeness, that is in time and space, between the influence source and the individual. So the more immediate and present the source is, the stronger its impact is going to be on a person also. Um, when there's physical proximity, that can also influence things. Uh, and number, when there are is a large number of a group that that is pushing someone, that is going to uh, impact someone. So, for instance, a group of ten people um, will be very persuasive, and it's going to be more persuasive than a group of two people. But the, it, this influence only comes to a point because a group of 50 people isn't really any more persuasive than a group of 20 people, for example. And so that's where we have this whole idea of the impact is of the social impact theory really kind of boils down to the, that SIN acronym, which stands for strength of the source, immediacy of the source, and the number of sources all of which can play a significant role in social impact. And of course, we've uh, explored a little bit of cognitive dissonance, that whole idea that um, of Leon Fessinger that refers to the discomfort we experience when we hold two conflicting beliefs or engage in behavior that contradicts our beliefs. And this comfort, this discomfort motivates us to reduce resonance by changing our beliefs and attitudes and actions and making cognitive dissonance uh, a critical element in persuasion. So all of that is uh, very important in the whole idea of persuading somebody and influencing somebody. So three key terms I want to leave with you. First off, the idea of cognitive dissonance, which is a psychological discomfort experienced when holding conflicting beliefs, attitudes, or behaviors, and which motivates individuals to reduce the inconsistency that they have between their thoughts and their behaviors. And this whole idea, remember, was developed by Leon Fessinger, um, who explains how internal discomfort can lead to lasting changes in attitudes and behaviors. Then there's the idea of social proof, which is a type of influence where 
individuals conform to what they perceive as the common behavior of the group. So social proof is effective because people often assume that it's others. If others are doing something, it must be the correct action. And then finally, groupthink. And groupthink is that phenomenon in which the desire for group cohesion leads to poor decision making. Uh, as group members suppress dissenting opinions and fail to critically evaluate alternatives. And so Irving Janus outlined this concept and identified its symptoms, uh, such as self-censorship, illusion of unanimity, and the pressure on dissenters. So we'll leave that for today. Thank you very much for this a lecture on persuasion. Thank you for engaging in it, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, and I'll see you next week. You take care. Bye-bye.